Okay, well, I'm going to designate myself Blondie on this uh, Glastonbury, uh, uh, Glastonbury analogy, uh, sort of making a comeback. No. Um, I'm Jill Rutter. I'm director, uh, program director at the Institute for Government, which is a charity dedicated to improving the effectiveness of government, um, funded by someone you might have heard of, a uh, very long-standing former Minister of Science, uh, Lord Sainsbury. We were found about four years ago. Uh, and we look at sort of government processes rather than the substance of policy. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things today. First, I am very clearly the least expert person here. I am probably the only person without a master's degree, um, certainly the only person probably without science A-levels. Um, when my parents went to my chemistry teacher and said, Jill quite likes chemistry, she'd quite like to do it for A-level, the chemistry teacher's sort of face fell and said, no, no, it doesn't fit with what she's doing, don't, don't let her do it. So I have no science background. But the bit that you all need to know is I am a really typical Whitehall policymaker. I have a degree from Oxford in PPE. I have a very good degree in Oxford from PPE, uh, like many of my peers, but I haven't studied any further. I did that quite a long time ago. I didn't even do that much economics. So I am really typical of the people you are trying to influence. So that's <laughs> point one. And when I went from the Treasury, where it's easy, they do economics, we get that, economics is quite easy to understand, to DEFRA, uh, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, I was really quite scared because in DEFRA they talk about things that I genuinely find extraordinarily difficult to get any sort of handle on, to understand and to even know, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I know what questions to ask these little economics, economists who are coming to me with their garbagey models and outputs and stuff like that and don't have any underlying hypothesis that makes a moment of sense. But I don't know what to do if Miles or Bob comes to me and rabbits on about something that is so far past my chemistry O level that I just do not know what they're talking about. And I gave up physics much earlier because I couldn't stand my physics teachers. So anyway, so I'm quite a typical policymaker. So that's one. So that is the sort of policymaking class in embryo. Uh, and actually, if you think I'm exaggerating, uh, we did some analysis of the degree backgrounds of the permanent sections in charge of departments. Not one has a science degree. There are two mathematicians. Everybody else, uh, there are more economists than there were 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But basically, I'm pretty typical. The second thing I just want to say is there's quite an interesting talk about evidence. Uh, we use evidence as this thing. Now, there are two ways of evidence. There's evidence which is sort of, you know, this nice process of scientific discovery or whatever. I would put it to you that actually in government, the way in which we use evidence is much more like the way in which we use evidence in a court of law, which is an adversarial use of evidence. Uh, now, DEFRA, though one of the most evidence-based departments, isn't completely exempt. Uh, my very esteemed former colleague, Miles Parker, used to say DEFRA wanted to be first with the best evidence, which sounds to me as though Miles was wanting to give DEFRA a source of competitive advantage, that's an economic concept, folks, a source of competitive advantage within the Whitehall battles by our evidence being better than your evidence, and that would help DEFRA win its arguments. So I think you need to be aware that uh, evidence can be used in that sort of adversarial way. So that's a bit of a sort of framing. You've got really sort of inexpert people in quite senior, influential positions. Uh, you've got people who actually want to use evidence, particularly on things they really care about, to win their arguments, to win whether it's battles over resources or battles over priorities or to get my bill into the Queen's speech or whatever. That's the sort of way I need evidence. But the third thing to remember is that actually policy is not this undifferentiated lump. All policies are not equal. Um, there are policies that politicians come in because they care about them. And these are their flagship policies that they want to do. Um, but some of you may be aware of a guy called Steve Hilton, who is currently on sabbatical at Stanford, who is Prime Minister's uh, chief strategist. And Steve Hilton had a really rude wake-up call when he came into government, because he discovered that actually he said, only 30% of the things we do in government are the things we want to do. The other 70% are things that are the civil services agenda. And even worse, they're things that are coming from Europe. 
And that, yeah. So what's going on here? So the rest of us would say, well, wake up and smell the daisies, pop it. Uh, that's what government's like. You have to deal with things you don't want to. <coughs> Hillary Benn did not uh, get randomly appointed to DEFRA and say, I want to spend my first two months dealing with floods all over the country. But actually, if you're the minister there, that's what you're going to have to do. Um, I think that's both an opportunity and a threat to scientists, to scientific advice and expert advice, because I think the role of scientists and experts is very different on the 30% where ministers have a real agenda, probably come in with views that they have formed in opposition. These are the flagship things that they want to do against the 70% of things which are these sort of semi-technocratic issues now, Miles and Bob will probably be appalled by this, but very few ministers probably see being appointed to DEFRA, Jim Pace was probably the exception, but being appointed to DEFRA as the thing that they want to do. Gee, most of those sorts of issues that you deal with in DEFRA are the, oh, well, okay, I'll do this, and maybe I'm on my way down, so it's just, you know, staving off the exit door, and I get the ministerial car for one or two years longer, or I'm on my way up and I'll do a David Miliband and find an issue I can really run with that will enable me to get the hell out of here as soon as possible. But uh, there are quite a lot of departments and transport is like that, probably, yeah, whatever. Well, actually, ministers don't really come with a very big agenda and actually I think there's a very different, uh, different use for scientific advice in those. <coughs> on the first, on the big flagship issues, actually, the ministerial appetite for evidence is probably, at least in the first run, pretty low pretty low. They will come in with views. They might have drawn on academic research beforehand when they come in, but they'll actually come in with pretty formed views. They want to get cracking on and move on. And there, the best you can probably manage is a bit of challenge. So very interesting questions on the space for challenge. Um, and a bit of, well, shall we try and find out whether it's working, a bit of evaluation and stuff like that. And you'll actually probably be quite lucky if you can actually build in proper evaluation into big flagship policies. There's a really different agenda and role, I think, for expert advice on that sort of 70% set of issues which are less political in a big P way. They may still be very political in a small P way, but they may be less political, but which are less crucial to shaping the sort of political debate and in many ways the political fortunes, whatever. So if I'm there as this sort of, you know, slightly amateur generalist, whatever, pejorative word this audience might want to do, policymaker. What am I looking for in my expert advisor? Well, first of all, I might not really thank you for this straight away, but I will in the longer run. I want you to alert me to the issues that are likely to come up and bite me. So I want you to be in touch with what is going on, what external thinking is, what are emerging trends. I want you to tell me that that nasty thing that's killing ash trees in Denmark might transfer into the UK ash population, or I want you to tell me it's okay, you know, what they call ash trees are not what we call ash trees, so they're quite different and it's actually okay because it's unpronounceable disease, cholera, whatever it's called, is actually not a risk to UK ash. I want to know about that. Do I need to you know whatever and stuff like that? So I need you to alert me to those issues. And I think it's really interesting if you see something like the Chief Medical Officer's report, the way that Dame Sally Davis has said that she thinks that actually the issue of antibiotic resistance should be going up the political agenda. No minister has come into government because they want to deal with antibiotic resistance, but equally they have to start framing that agenda. So alerting people who are not tracking the latest peer-reviewed journals. 95%, I mean, one of the things about having subscription-only academic journals is no policymakers in government read academic journals. I mean, it's not going to penetrate through if it's only in the academic journals. We rely on our scientists' friends to say there's something interesting going on in these academic journals to tell us about that. So that's the first thing. I want you to alert me to emerging issues. I'm not caught off guard. So I'm not sort of suddenly blindsided by something doing... Because actually, that's going to divert my political capital from the things I want to do to the things I really don't want to do. The second thing is you've got to help me. You've got to explain these issues. And you've got to be good at communicating these issues to me in a way I can understand. And you've got to be able to interpret this mass of evidence. If the other people doing PPE were like me doing PPE, we read the start of the article, we skipped all those nasty equations, and then we got to the end of the things. We won't have done, remember we did this 30 years ago when this was an essay writing discipline, not an experimental discipline. And Whitehall is still dominated by essay writers, not experimentalists. 
Um, we need you to tell us, how seriously do I have to take this? How certain is it? What's the obvious? How disputed is it? You know, how much do I have to pay attention to these people over here? Whatever, et cetera, et cetera, because that's all very important. And then I need you to... to this goes back to Roger Pielke. I don't know quite how he pronounces his name. I pronounce it very Germanically. Uh, whatever. You need to offer me uh, a range of technically sound options. I don't want to be told there's only one thing I can do. I need to know what are the numbers of things I can do. And then I want you to help me to decide. And I say that word very advisedly. That's help me to decide. You are not going to decide. I, in my role as the new minister, uh, if I'd taken a slightly different course in 1978, uh, I'm going to decide, but you're going to help me. And you have to reckon that actually science is an enabler, but it's not going to be the deciding factor in very, very, very few cases. You may hate economics, but there is a reason why economics has emerged as the uh, dominant discipline in Whitehall, and that's because actually fundamentally political economy dominates. There are two bits. There's a battle over values, ideals, objectives, and there's a battle over value for money and resource prioritization. And when you get into that, the only real metric we can deal with on that is through the language of economics. So you need to get real about the economics. Um, the second thing is that even if the economics are compelling, the politics might be horrible, and the morals might be horrible, actually. There's lots of things we do that actually would be, in some versions, the logically right thing to do, but actually are ethically unacceptable and are too far to go, so we don't do things. So you've got to be able to recognise that those are going to be players in the debate too. You have to recognise that we're constrained by a network of international laws. We might think that it's the best thing in the world to promote, say, harm-reducing tobacco products, but there is an EU directive there at the moment that says that we can't do that. And we need to be aware of that. We need to then work out how we might deploy our, uh, our knowledge and expertise to change that. And actually, even if all those things stack up, we come across the practicability and the implementability of things. And that matters too. Because actually, however good and however compelling the policy case for something is, if we can't actually work on the ground in a feasible way, then actually it's not worth starting with. So any policy needs to be refracted through all those lenses. So that's really what we want as a view. You are enablers, you are informers, but you're not deciders. The best scientific advisors in government are people, I'm going to make him blush here, people like Bob Watson, who know their science, but love the politics too. Uh, and you actually need that blend of people who get the legitimacy of politics, because if you don't get the legitimacy of politics, you're not going to be terribly helpful to me as an internal Whitehall advisor. In my last couple of minutes, looks at James, I'm just going to run through about saying, how is this going to refract through the debates going on? I know we've got some international uh, colleagues here, but just what's going on in Whitehall at the moment? I think there's a bunch of conflicting trends. The biggest trend in Whitehall, forget the language about the Civil Service Reform Plan, the biggest trend in Whitehall is austerity, downsizing, cuts, whatever you like to say. Uh, departments are all committed over this spending review period to reduce their administrative costs by 30%. Science and evidence budgets are going down, headcounts going down, uh, arm's length bodies are being killed off. So that's the dominant trend, number one. The second consequence of that is people are being spread thinner, they're having wider spans, there's more churn, so they're losing networks, relationships, things. Now this is an area where when we did our research two years ago for our reports on better policy making, people already said, ministers already said they thought there was a lack of knowledge and expertise in Whitehall. So it's being spread thinner, churning around more, being made more difficult. <coughs> Countervailing trend is open policy making. That's a space to play for. Uh, we can pick that up later. I think it'd be interesting to see how that pans out. I think it's really interesting if we can get that into the space of open question framing and open evidence challenge. Because actually, I think that's where it has the most potential to add value. The third thing, though, I would say, and I think this is quite an important thing, is that one of the government's immediate acts was to kill off a lot of public bodies uh, early in 2010. Now, departments had various reactions to the public bodies' agenda. Uh, there was a bit of a numbers game. That numbers game resulted in quite a lot of advisory non-departmental public bodies, bit of Whitehall jargon there, 
being rebadged advisory committees. That's actually what they always were. The interesting question is, does that change of apparent status make any difference? The universities of Birmingham and Sheffield have got a giant grant from the SRC, and that's one of the questions they're going to try and answer. There's still quite a lot of them around. Some were killed off because they were redundant. Don't know if that's... Some actually quite long-standing and I think quite valuable advisory bodies were killed off. And I think the RCEP is actually you know, one of those quite interesting cases of point. The RCEP may be a bit of an outdated model, but I think the Caroline Spellman argument that actually environment was so mainstream it was now obsolescent was not particularly compelling because I don't think there was a comparable place for longer-term outside government strategic thinking about some of those longer-term issues. All the bodies that remain are all subject to triennial reviews, unless actually you're an advisory committee, which is probably then a better place to be. So if you survive this time, uh, someone might be out to get you in another three years. Um, so I think that's really interesting. I think on the plus side, post the Nut Affair, we did have the development of principles for scientific advice to ministers, and I think that actually was a much more honest statement of the status of those bodies and the status of the way the government used that. One of the big drivers, though, is as... Whitehall hollows out, I think there is a growing realisation of the need for integration across the landscape and a need for Whitehall to be able to draw much more explicitly on the technical and expertise of those sorts of bodies. That wasn't actually the first line. The first reaction of ministers coming in was they didn't want to be taking advice from those sorts of bodies. I think they've now realised that actually in the austerity climate, you don't have the luxury of not doing that. So the sort of initial don't get involved in policy, we do policy, you do technical stuff, I think uh, those borderlines are being done. So I think it's really interesting to see where the borderlines are being drawn. And it's quite interesting, one of the things that's just happened is there's just been a review, Miles was on it, of the government science and engineering profession. One of the really interesting questions is, is Whitehall going to emerge in this reform process very different the bit that's really disheartening is that Miles's review of the science engineering profession quoted exactly the words in the Fulton Review of 1968 <laughs> about how specialists were still not transferring into more senior grades in the civil service. I think if the senior civil service is not going to suffer from severe groupthink, we need to persuade some of people with science and engineering backgrounds that actually they want to make it as generalist policymakers. Anyway, so we're not just all PPE graduates with no science A-levels. Anyway, that's...